Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. In the city of South Ashburnham, Massachusetts, on the night of January 25, 1967, one of the most celebrated cases of UFO abduction began. Betty Andreason was working in her kitchen while her seven children, mother and father, were in the living room. The lights in the house briefly blinked, then a reddish light began to beam through the kitchen window. Betty ran to comfort her frightened children. Her father ran into the kitchen to peer out the window and find the source of the unusual light. To his utter shock, he saw five odd-looking beings coming toward the house. The beings came walking in right through the wooden door. What happened next would test the imagination and strength of even an open-minded, adventurous person. The entire family was suddenly put into a state of suspended animation, which would usher in the most nightmarish events that would take place. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! This is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… In March of 2000, a New South Wales mother did the unthinkable, and 23 years later the first officer on the scene shares what he encountered. And it is extremely disturbing. We'll look inside the mind of the sadistic murderess Catherine Knight. Image is everything, as they say and nowadays it seems the perfect image is to either have all of the right curves in all of the right places or to be stick-thin. But imagine being so thin that you could pass for a living skeleton. Such was the life of Claude Ambrose Seurat. Essie Dunbar was 30 years old when she had an epileptic seizure that left her doctor certain she was dead. However, when her sister arrived at the funeral and asked to see her one last time, the story goes that Dunbar sat right up inside her coffin. Did King Solomon possess a magical ring given to him directly from heaven with which he could control Astaroth, a prince of hell? Two men are recovering after surgery in their hospital beds in two different hospitals, two years apart one in 2017 and the other in 2019. Both men suddenly disappear from their beds without a trace, until later when both men are found dead in the ceilings of their respective hospitals. What happened? But first, although not the first high-profile claim of alien abduction, the extraordinary case of Betty Andreason is considered by many to be one of the most important and unique not least because the incidents stretch over several decades and share details with many other cases over the years. We begin with that story. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, connect with me on social media. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. The alien abductions of Betty Andreason took place not just once or twice, but multiple times over several years. Following her reports to MUFON of partial memories, 
Betty Andreessen would work with Dr. Raymond Fowler using hypnotic regression to unlock a lifetime of abduction experiences. These sessions would take place in phases and would last from the late 1970s into the mid-1990s. The case is also intriguing as it blurs heavily into such territory as faith and perception. This is perhaps due to Betty's determination to make sense of the bizarre events that appear to have been unfolding around her most of her life. Although it would prove not to be the first encounter, the incident that would spark enough memory to have her look at the events again took place at her home in the northeast of the United States over 50 years ago. On the evening of January 25, 1967, a little after 6.30 p.m., Betty Andreessen, along with her parents and seven children, were at their Massachusetts home in South Ashburnham. Suddenly, a flickering of the lights captured everyone's attention before absolute darkness took hold around them. Within a matter of seconds, a strange glow shined through the windows from outside. It would turn a warm orange color as it illuminated the inside of the property. She would later describe the scene as if someone had put them into a vacuum, as if time were standing still. Betty would tell the children to wait in the living room. She was in the kitchen, along with her father, who had moved towards the window to get a better view. He could make out several humanoid creatures approaching out of the lights. Then he could see one of them right outside the window. It turned to look at him, and upon making eye contact, Betty's father appeared to go into a strange, trance-like state of suspended animation. He would not remember anything more of the encounter. Suddenly, the five humanoids came through the walls and were inside the Andreasons' home. Betty would describe this passing through the walls as if they faded in and out of existence. All of those in the house, aside from Betty, were placed into the same kind of suspended animation, like Betty's father. They then asked her to join them outside. Fearing for the safety of her family, however, one of the humanoids had to release one of the children, Becky, from her suspended state so as to prove no harm would come to them. Interestingly, years later, Becky would recall this incident through regression. Following the demonstration of her family's safety, Betty agreed to follow these strange creatures. She would explain later that she felt compelled to do so. One of the visitors would remain behind to guard the house and the remaining members of the Andreasen family. Not at all aware of how she did so, Betty would float through the solid wood door of the kitchen as she followed her otherworldly guides. She floated on board an oval-shaped craft, and before she had time to fully take in her surroundings, she could feel the momentum shift as the craft raced upwards to the sky. Betty described various procedures and examinations taking place before entering a tank of liquid. She was also given a strange liquid to drink that was to have a tranquilizing effect. The next thing she knew, she found herself floating towards another chamber. A chorus of strange voices met her, telling her of their choosing her to show something important to the world. Following this, Betty would find herself back in her home, the humanoids still there, but now systematically placing each member of the family into their beds. All were still in their trance, Betty would watch these events take place, with one of the humanoids stating they were here to help humanity, but that humans will fear them. Betty also claimed she was told that these creatures were not bound by time, and perhaps most intriguingly, that man is not made of just flesh and blood. It wasn't until a decade later that Betty would begin to recall the events of that evening and even then it wasn't until she underwent hypnotic regression under the watch of Dr. Raymond Fowler that everything aside from the strange lights and the five creatures entering the room came back in full. Her first set of hypnotic regressions would take place over a 12-month period between January 1977 and January 1978. Although she would undergo further sessions with Dr. Fowler that would stretch right through into the 1990s, the accounts of her first experience were fascinating, perhaps not least due to the amount of supporting, if circumstantial, evidence that would lend them credence. For example, 
Betty would claim the reason her parents were with her was due to her husband being in hospital following a car crash. Hospital records do show that this was true and show her husband's admittance from mid-January to March 1967. Furthermore, she recalled there was snow on the ground, but the air felt warmer than it should and there was fog. Weather records show that there was mist rising from melting snow due to an increase in temperatures. There was also a power failure in the region that evening, at the same time Betty recalled the power going out in their home. Her father, who was in a trance throughout the episode, could recall a, quote, child in a Halloween costume, unquote, looking through the window. Even records with the television schedules would prove their statements of what was on television prior to the incident proved to be correct. Betty would reveal other abduction experiences during future sessions with Dr. Fowler. Her first experience happened as far back as 1944, when she was merely seven years old. She was in a playhouse waiting for a friend when a strange red orb entered the small play space and settled between her eyes. As it did so, her head began to ring out with strange voices telling her they were watching her. They also claimed they would meet again when she was 12 years of age, which they did five years later in 1949. She was walking in woodlands in nearby Westminster when a gray creature dressed in a one-piece coverall awash with buttons and symbols stepped out before her. It pressed a button on its coverall and a red orb emerged. The orb, like before, settled on her face between her eyes, and again, her head was filled with the strange but now familiar voices. A year later, in 1950, an orb-like object would take her on what is arguably one of the most bizarre encounters on record. Once on board, a strange instrument was placed inside her mouth which held down her tongue. She found herself on a bizarre wheel made of a rubber-like substance. The craft entered a body of water she did not know where and would emerge in an underground base. Betty would recall going through a museum of time with different versions of humans throughout history on show in glass-like containers. Also during this encounter, although she didn't elaborate on how, she was caused to have an out-of-body experience and would enter into a world of light. She would describe this encounter as one of feeling at oneness with all things. As the decades were re-explored through the hypnosis sessions, Betty would reveal more and more encounters. On several occasions, she would describe waking from sleep to find strange entities in her bedroom. She would even receive forewarnings of upcoming trying events in her life. In 1975, for example, a bedroom visitor informed her that her marriage would end in divorce. It did shortly after. Two years later, in 1977, she was warned that two of her sons would meet an untimely end. A short while later, both were killed in a car accident. She would also undergo several out-of-body experiences. One particular time in 1978, she even experienced a shared encounter with her second husband, Bob. Each found themselves, or at least the essence of themselves, in a large, round alien facility. They witnessed a bizarre and advanced operation taking place on three of their family members, meaning they too were subject to abductions. This last point is interesting as many abduction cases not only reveal a long history in the subject, but often incidents of family members sharing such encounters. There was also increasing signs of implants inside their bodies. Even more disturbing was evidence of scoop marks which looked similar to biopsy tests. Chillingly, for Fowler, he would discover these marks on his arm also suggesting that whatever had an interest in the Andreasons now had an interest in him. For much of the sessions and her memories of the encounters, Betty would call the entities that visited her angels. She was a religious person, and this may simply have been her way of interoperating such strange encounters. For example, when she was 24 years old in 1961, she felt a strange luring from her home into the woods nearby she would encounter a tall, gray humanoid in the woodland who she believed was a messenger of the Lord. Although it is not unique, 
Connections to religion or some kind of supreme entity in modern-day UFO accounts are rare. Encounters that reference a specific god or religion, however, are even rarer. This assertion that these entities were angels from the Lord would lead many to accuse Andreasen of seeking monetary gain. Indeed, the several books on her encounters over two decades did little to dissuade those who felt this way. However, many who've studied the case more in-depth disagree. They believe there is more to it than merely looking for money or fame by Andreasen or Fowler. Many UFO cases from antiquity were often perceived to be divine events. Indeed, one could make a good argument that the vast majority of ancient and religious writings, particularly in the Western world, have their basis in a misunderstanding of events and incorrect interpretations. Perhaps, given Betty's already strong faith, this is a similar modern-day example of such a divine perception. Coming up, in March of 2000, a new South Wales mother did the unthinkable, and 23 years later, the first officer on the scene shares what he encountered, which is extremely disturbing. We'll look inside the mind of the sadistic murderess Catherine Knight. Plus, imagine being so thin that you could pass for a living skeleton. Such was the life of Claude Ambrose Seurat. These stories and more when Weird Darkness Returns. Hey, weirdos! The organizations we're supporting with our annual Overcoming the Darkness fundraiser this month are working to make it easier for those in the darkness to come into the light. And I do have a few people that I'd like to thank that have come in over the last 24 hours. Stephanie came in with a $100 donation. Sherry donated $25. Kate sent in $100 herself. Wow, thank you, Kate. Elizabeth sent in $50. Janet sent in $25. Jeff had $5 he was able to spare. Thank you so much for that. Samuel donated $25. Stacy donated $35. Brian donated $25. Daryl also donated $25. So within the last just 24 hours, we raised $415, bringing us to a grand total of $915 raised so far towards our $5,000 goal. We still have a long way to go, but we've made some great progress in the last 24 hours. A huge thanks to all of you who decided to step up and get involved. WeirdDarkness.com slash overcoming. The fundraiser ends at the end of October, so please give what you can. WeirdDarkness.com slash overcoming. If you were to imagine a twisted, cold-blooded killer who brutally stabbed, skinned, decapitated, and cooked their significant other's head in a pot before serving them up on a plate with some vegetables, what kind of monster would you be picturing in your mind? It sounds like the work of the same horror movie screenwriters that conjured up Silence of the Lambs menacing Hannibal Lecter or Texas Chainsaw Massacre's terrifying Leatherface. But this particular figure's stomach-turning crimes were not some fanciful work of fiction written for a gory Hollywood script. They were 100% real. It was in the tiny Australian town of Aberdeen, in the country of New South Wales, that one of the most gruesome crimes in the history of the nation took place in March of 2000. The sadistic nature of the crime was just as shocking as the person responsible for it, an average, normal-looking, run-of-the-mill Aussie mother and wife. Catherine Knight's wavy auburn locks, soft, round face, and wide, relaxed smile are not the usual features that spring to mind when one thinks about what a murderer might look like. But behind this seemingly unassuming exterior is a dangerous and violent criminal. She was born in Tenterfield, New South Wales, in October 1955, half an hour after her twin sister Joy. 
Her home life was highly dysfunctional, allegedly tainted with domestic violence, rife alcoholism, and sexual abuse within her childhood home. Knight claimed she had been sexually abused from a young age by different men as she was growing up, but asserted that it was never by her own father. Some of her classmates remembered her as a bully who would stand over smaller children and fly into a murderous rage if things did not go her way. On the flip side, others have stated she could be a very dedicated student and even earned awards for her good behavior. Knight was reportedly fascinated with knives and was over the moon to score her dream job as an avatar worker when she was just 16. She was later promoted and given her own set of butcher knives, which she would hang up above her bed wherever she lived in case she needed them. Before moving in with her would-be murder victim, John Price, in 1995, the mom of four had a string of relationships that all had one thing in common – her extreme violence. She married David Collette in 1976 and reportedly tried to strangle him on their wedding night after he fell asleep following three rounds of intercourse. While heavily pregnant, she burnt all her husband's clothing and shoes before hitting him across the back of the head with a frying pan, all because he had arrived home late from a darts competition after making the finals. She continued her violent behavior into her next relationship with David Saunders, who she met in 1986. The following year, she reportedly cut the throat of his two-month-old puppy right in front of his eyes for no other reason than to demonstrate what she would do to him if he ever cheated on her. On another occasion, Knight was said to have hit his face with an iron before stabbing him in the stomach with a pair of scissors. Reprehensible and sickening, these incidents were just stepping stones to the stomach-turning horror of what was to come. John Price, or Pricey as he was known about town, was a popular local figure in Aberdeen. He was known for being a top bloke with a charming and down-to-earth demeanor. John was likable, generous, kind, and would always be the first to lend a helping hand to someone in need. At the start of Knight and John's relationship, it was said that she treated him well and the pair enjoyed a romantic partnership and vigorous sex life. But sadly, this honeymoon period would not last. The gruesome, bloody crime scene that Detective Sergeant Robert Wells walked into on the morning of March 1st, 2000 will be etched into his psyche forever. The now 65-year-old husband, father, and grandfather from the New South Wales North Coast has since retired but has never forgotten the horrors he saw during this time on the force. Officially diagnosed with severe chronic post-traumatic stress disorder (PTSD). He now visits a psychologist regularly to help manage his condition. While he does not feel that Catherine Knight's case was the sole contributor to his diagnosis, Mr. Wells said it was certainly one of the worst cases he had ever witnessed. We didn't get much information about what was going on at the house, just what we had to get there quick, he told news.com.au. I was actually stationed in another police station about 40 minutes away. By the time I got to the scene, Catherine was leaving in an ambulance. She'd taken some pills, not enough to kill her, but they made her sleepy. I walked inside and saw the human skin pelt hanging up, completely intact in one piece. John Price's decapitated and skinned body was lying on the floor in the lounge room. We found his head. It had been boiled and cooked in a pot on the stove. There were a number of slices of rump taken off his human rump baked in the oven with some vegetables and put on plates with the name of his two children on them. After it was determined that she was lucid and not suffering from any mental health conditions, Detective Sergeant Wells sat down to talk with her. He recalled how she was ranting and raving, claiming she had been a victim of domestic violence and abused by men throughout her life, but there was never any admission of guilt in relation to John's murder. Mr. Wells recalled how there was a moment when he looked at her face and instantly knew everything she was saying was a lie. The fact was, Catherine Knight had been violent towards the men she'd been in relationships with over the years, he said. They were all quite smaller than her. It's very unusual for a woman to do this. 
In all my years on the force, I've never once been called to a scene where a woman was violently beating up on a man. Most of the time, from my experience, it's men being violent toward their female partners. Catherine Knight was a very unique case. In a case where men were hurt or killed in a domestic setting, it was by another male partner, family member, friend, or acquaintance. New South Wales Supreme Court Justice Barry O'Keefe sentenced Catherine Knight to life in prison on November 8, 2001. She was the first woman in Australia's history to be sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Speaking about the case, the judge said that she did not qualify for mercy because of her cruel, vicious behavior. She showed him no mercy. She had not expressed any contrition or remorse. If released, she poses a serious threat to the security of society, he said. I'm satisfied beyond any doubt that such a murder was premeditated. I'm further satisfied in the same way that not only did she plan the murder, but she also enjoyed the horrific acts which followed in its wake as part of a ritual of death and defilement. The things which she did after the death of Mr. Price indicate cognition, volition, calm, and skill. I'm satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that her evil actions were playing out of her resentments arising out of her rejection by Mr. Price, her impending expulsion from Mr. Price's home, which he wanted to retain for his children. The last minutes of his life must have been a time of abject terror for him, as they were a time of utter enjoyment for her. Knight, at the time of this recording, is 67 years old and is serving out her life sentence at Silverwater Prison, a women's correctional center located 20 kilometers west from Sydney's Central Business District. Mr. Wells was diagnosed with chronic severe PTSD after his retirement in 2011. He advocates for mental health awareness and encourages all men and women, especially those working in emergency services, to seek help if they need it. Although things have gotten better, I think there's still a lot of stigma around the issue of mental health, he says. After 20-plus years on the job, you become a bit numb to everything you see. You might not feel like you're affected at the time, but it can catch up with you later. My condition is something I manage. I see a psychologist once a month, sometimes I depend on medication, sometimes I don't. I have a good partner who keeps me level and good, strong, loving children and grandchildren. They want me to wake up every day and keep going. That's my therapy. Freak shows were a very popular medium of entertainment in Europe and the United States of America for the major part of the 19th century. These formally organized exhibitions presented people with various physical deformities and anomalies, such as conjoined twins, people with extra limbs or no limbs, midgets, giants, as well as fabricated human exhibits such as cannibals and savages. Living skeletons were part of the freak show's repertoire. These were often men with unusually thin bodies. One of the most famous living skeletons, or human skeletons as they were sometimes referred to, was Claude Ambrose Seurat. Claude Seurat was born in Troyes in the department of Champagne, France on April 10, 1797. At birth, Seurat seemed healthy and normal, but as the child grew, he began to display symptoms of bodily wasting. At the age of 10, Seurat was as healthy as other children except that his chest was depressed and he was much weaker. By the age of 14, his frame dwindled away to the skeleton form, which it ever afterwards retained. At the age of 28, he was reported to be 5 feet 7 inches tall and weighed only 78 pounds, or 35 kilograms. Seurat's case excited great interest in France, and a number of medical men offered Seurat's father considerable sums of money to acquire the body of Seurat after his death. But Seurat's father refused, stating that in the event of his son's death, he should be peacefully consigned to the cemetery of his native city. In 1825, Seurat traveled to London to be exhibited at the Chinese Gallery in Pall Mall. One of the visitors, William Hone, who went to attend the exhibition, wrote, I was instantly riveted by his amazing emaciation. He seemed another Lazarus come forth without his grave clothes and for a moment I was too consternated to observe more than his general appearance. 
My eye then first caught the arm as the most remarkable limb. From the shoulder to the elbow, it's like an ivory German flute, somewhat deepened in color by age. It is not larger, and the skin is of that hue and not having a trace of muscle. It is as perfect a cylinder as a writing rule. Amazed by the wasted limbs, I was still more amazed by the extraordinary depression of the chest. Its indentation is similar to that which an overcareful mother makes in the pillowed surface of an infant's bed for its repose. Nature has here inverted her own order and turned the convex inwards, while the nobler organs, obedient to her will, maintain life by the gentle exercise of their wanted functions in a lower region. Below the ribs, the trunk so immediately curves in that the red band of the silk covering, though it is only loosely placed, seems a tourniquet to constrict the bowels within their prison house, and the hip bones being of their natural size, the waist is like a wasp's. By this part of the frame, we are reminded of some descriptions of the abstemious and bedouin Arab of the desert, in whom, it is said, the abdomen seems to cling to the vertebra. If the integument of the bowels can be called flesh, it is the only flesh on the body, for it seems to have wholly shrunk from the limbs, and where the muscles that have not wholly disappeared remain, they are also shrunk. He wears shoes to keep cold from his feet, which are not otherwise shaped than those of people who have been accustomed to wear tight shoes. His instep is good, and by no means so flat as in the generality of tavern waiters. His legs are not more ill-shaped than in extremely thin or much-waisted persons. The right leg, which is somewhat larger than the left, is not less than were the legs of the late Mr. Suet, the comedian. Contemporary physicians regarded Surat as a case of Marcoras, an early obliteration of the lacteal vessels and mesenteric glands. Richard Park, a senior registrar in gastroenterology and general medicine in Glasgow Royal Infirmary, suggests that there's little evidence for malabsorption, and the emaciation was likely caused by inadequate oral intake of food. Surat's daily intake of food amounted to a penny roll in small quantities of wine due to dysphagia, which is evident from a description of Surat by William Hone, who said, "...in eating, he masticates his victuals very much." taking small pieces as the passage to the stomach would not admit of any great repletion, and in drinking the same precaution is required, otherwise suffocation would ensue. A slight impediment to his swallowing with dispatch of such morsels as are not cut very small. Sorrel also suffered from a number of congenital deformities, such as Sprengel's deformity, which was first identified in 1891, 66 years after Sorrel's exhibition in London. Park believes that Seurat may have been the earliest recorded case of Sprangle's deformity. Seurat may also have had Klippelfile syndrome, a triad of short neck, low posterior hairline, and reduced neck movements. A year after his exhibition in Britain, Seurat went back to France where he became part of a traveling circus that arrived in Bordeaux in 1826. His last recorded performance was in 1833 at Dinan in Brittany, after which Siro disappeared from the public eye. Nobody knew where he went, but it was rumored that he went back to London, where he died, after which Sir Astley Cooper performed the necropsy. Sirrah's skeleton was allegedly placed in the museum at the Royal College of Surgeons in London, although there are no records of Sir Astley Cooper's findings nor of Sirrah's skeleton in the College Museum. Writing in 1868, historian Gilbert Richard Redgrave commented, have not yet been able to ascertain the date of his death. Who knows whether the poor fellow may not still be going the round of the French fairs. When Weird Darkness returns, did King Solomon possess a magical ring given to him directly from heaven with which he could control Astaroth, the Prince of Hell? We'll look into the possibility. But first, Essie Dunbar was 30 years old when she had an epileptic seizure that left her doctor certain she was dead. She was then buried. But that's only the story of her first death and burial. You see, she was buried prematurely. That story is up next. Hi. 
October is the anniversary of Weird Darkness, and we celebrate by raising funds to help people who suffer from depression. Catherine sent in a donation during a previous Overcoming the Darkness campaign and said, I wish your podcast had been around several years ago. My brother would have loved it, and maybe he wouldn't have felt so defeated. Rob committed suicide in October 2012, leaving devastated family and friends. I hope this donation gets the help and support they need and understand others want them to stay in their lives. We all know someone who's been affected by depression or suicide, and Catherine's message is the perfect reason for you to give whatever you can this month during our Overcoming the Darkness fundraiser, where 100% of the proceeds are donated to organizations that help people struggling with depression. You can learn more about these organizations and make a donation of any amount at WeirdDarkness.com slash overcoming. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash overcoming. During a hot South Carolina summer in 1915, 30-year-old Essie Dunbar died of an epileptic seizure. Or so her family thought. They called a doctor who confirmed that Dunbar showed no signs of life. The family then arranged a funeral, placed Dunbar in a wooden coffin, invited friends and family to mourn her death, and finally buried her. At the request of Dunbar's sister, who arrived late to the funeral, Dunbar's coffin was dug up so that her sister could view Dunbar's body one last time. To everyone's profound shock, Dunbar was alive and smiling. Essie Dunbar had been buried alive, and she went on to live another 47 after her first death, or so the story goes. Not much is known about Essie Dunbar's life before her death in 1915. Born in 1885, Dunbar apparently lived a quiet existence in South Carolina for the first 30 years of her life. Most of her family lived nearby, though Dunbar also had a sister in the neighboring town. But in the summer of 1915, Dunbar suffered an epileptic seizure and collapsed. Dunbar's family called a doctor, D.K. Briggs of Blackville, South Carolina, for help, but he appeared to arrive too late. Briggs found no signs of life and told the family that Dunbar was dead. Heartbroken, Dunbar's family started to plan a funeral. According to the book Buried Alive – The Terrifying History of Our Most Primal Fear by Jan Bondison, link in the show notes, they decided to hold the funeral the next day at 11 a.m. to give Dunbar's sister time to travel to the surface. That morning, Essie Dunbar was placed in a wooden coffin. Three preachers conducted the service, which should have given Dunbar's sister plenty of time to arrive. When the service finished and Dunbar's sister was still nowhere to be seen, the family decided to proceed with the burial. They lowered Essie Dunbar's coffin six feet into the ground and covered it in dirt. But her story didn't end there. A few minutes after Essie Dunbar was buried, her sister finally arrived. She begged the preachers to allow her to see her sister one last time, and they agreed to dig up the coffin, which had just been buried. As the funeral attendees watched, Dunbar's freshly buried coffin was dug up. The lid was unscrewed. The coffin was open. And then shocked gasps and cries rang out, not in anguish but in shock. To the astonishment and terror of the crowd, Essie Dunbar sat up in her coffin and smiled at her sister, looking very much alive. According to Bondison's book, Buried Alive, the three ministers conducting the ceremony fell backward into the grave, the shortest suffering three broken ribs as the other two trampled him in their desperate effort to get out. Even Dunbar's own family ran from her as they believed that she was a ghost or some type of zombie sent to terrorize them. When she climbed out of her coffin and tried to follow them, they grew even more terrified. But Essie Dunbar was not a ghost, nor a zombie. She was just a 30-year-old woman who'd had the bad luck of being buried alive, and the good luck of being quickly dug back up again. Following her funeral, Essie Dunbar appeared to return to normal, to her quiet existence. In 1955, the Augusta Chronicle reported that she spent her days picking cotton, 
and that she'd outlived Briggs, the doctor who had first pronounced her dead in 1915. Dunbar has many friends today, a local doctor, Dr. O.D. Hammond, who treated one of the injured preachers during Dunbar's funeral, told the paper. She gets a nice-sized welfare check monthly and earns some money picking cotton. In fact, Dunbar lived for almost another decade more. She passed away on May 22, 1962, at Barnwell County Hospital in South Carolina. Local papers reported her death within the headline, Final Funeral Held for South Carolina Woman, and this time there were apparently no shocking moments during Dunbar's burial. But though Dunbar became something of a local legend, it's difficult to discern the fact and fiction of her story. In their fact check of Essie Dunbar's story, Snopes.com determined that the veracity of Dunbar's premature burial was unproven. That's because no contemporary accounts of Dunbar's 1915 funeral exist. Instead, the story seems to come from the book Buried Alive, published in 2001, almost a hundred years after the event, and from stories about Briggs' death in 1955. There's Octavia Smith, for example, who was buried in May of 1891 after she fell into a coma following the death of her infant son. It was only after Smith was buried that the townspeople realized that a strange sickness was going around, in which the infected appeared dead but awoke a few days later. Smith's coffin was dug up, but the townspeople were too late to save her. Smith had indeed woken up underground. Her horrified family found that she had shredded the inner coffin lining and died with bloody fingernails and a look of horror frozen on her face. As such, it's no surprise why stories like Essie Dunbar's or Octavia Smith's or any other account of being buried alive strike such fear into our hearts. There's something incredibly terrifying about the thoughts of waking up underground in an enclosed space where no one can hear you scream. The Seal of Solomon, or Ring of Solomon, is known as the Star of David in Jewish tradition and was the magical signet ring attributed to King Solomon in medieval Jewish tradition and in both Islamic and Western occultism. Described as a pentagram or hexagram, the ring was said to give Solomon the power over demons and jinn, that is, genies, and enable him to speak with animals. Thus, it became a powerful magical motif, amulet, and talisman in medieval and Renaissance-era occultism alchemy, and ceremonial magic. Constructed of brass and iron, the two parts of the ring sealed written commands addressed to a range of good and evil spirits. The origins of the legends surrounding the Seal of Solomon are difficult to establish, but it is known medieval Arabic writers developed the legend and the Hexagram Association claimed that the ring was engraved by God and sent directly to Solomon from heaven. The hexagram was placed on the flag of Israel in 1948, but has its origins in 14th century depictions of the Seal of Solomon. Because hexagrams were used so prominently on Jewish esoteric literature from the early medieval period, it's generally agreed by most scholars that the symbol entered the Kabbalistic tradition of medieval Spain from Arabic literature. References to the Seal of Solomon being a pentagram first appeared in Western Renaissance magic, for example, when English bishop and antiquarian White Kennet referred to the pentangle of Solomon having to the power of exercising demons. In Heptemeron, 1496, by Peter de Abano, the pentacle of Solomon was in reality a hexagram drawn out on floors in which magicians stood for protection while invoking demons. King Solomon's experiments with supernatural phenomena included his constraining of 72 spirits in a bronze vessel, about which he wrote to his son Rehoboam, who himself hid the book in his grave upon death. A group of Babylonian philosophers later discovered the book, but none could interpret it until the angel of the Lord appeared to Iogrevis, who placed a conjuration on the book, quote, that the unworthy, the unwise, or those who did not fear God would not attain the desired effect from any of the workings contained therein. Unquote. The legendary books of magic associated with the biblical King Solomon 
appear translated in the 15th to 17th century Italian Renaissance grimoires. The earliest is titled Key of Solomon, and the later 17th century grimoire is known as Clavicula Salomonis Regis, Lesser Key of Solomon. Influenced by earlier works of Jewish Kabbalists and Arab alchemists, the Key of Solomon appears on early Greek manuscripts dating to the 15th century, known as the Magical Treatise of Solomon. An English translation titled The Clavicle of Solomon, revealed by Ptolemy the Grecian, is dated to 1572, and a Hebrew text survives in two versions. Dated to the 16th century, the first is kept in the British Library, and the second Hebrew text was published by the famous British rabbi and Hebrew scholar Hermann Gollantz in 1903. A translation of the Latin manuscripts held at the British Library was published in 1889 by S. L. McGregor Mathers, and in 1914 L. W. De Lawrence published The Greater Key of Solomon. The Key of Solomon is written in two parts and provides magicians with the necessary information including highly mystical drawings required to perform specific magical operations. Besides rituals to make one invisible, to find stolen items, and to make someone fall in love, the book teaches how to draw on the power of God. Ultimately, using the perceived wisdom of Solomon, invocations and curses are used to command control over demons bringing them into alignment with one's will. Book 1 details the correct astrological conditions required to bless magical symbols and amulets with appropriate words to purify and prepare them, and Book 2 describes the magical operator's clothing, tools, and animal sacrifices required in order to purge themselves of the evils caused by sin, before invoking God's protection. One particular prayer was used to cast out demons. Quote, Lord Jesus Christ, the loving Son of God, which dost illuminate the hearts of all men in the world, lighten the darkness of my heart, and kindle the fire of thy most holy love in me. Give me true faith, perfect charity and virtue, whereby I may learn to fear and love thee, and keep thy commandments in all things, that when the last day shall come, the angel of God may peaceably take me and deliver me from the power of the devil, that I may enjoy everlasting rest amidst the company of the holy saints, and sit on thy right." Grant this, thou Son of the living God, for thy holy name's sake. Amen." Unquote. The Lesser Key of Solomon was also based on the magical rituals, invocations, and demon-binding spells of the biblical King Solomon, which he supposedly used to summon the spirits of demons that he commanded to build his temple. A 1904 publication by Samuel Little McGregor Mathers and Aleister Crowley has become an industry standard for most ceremonial magicians. Crowley said in the foreword to the book, I'm not concerned to deny the reality of all magical phenomena. If they are illusions, they are at least as real as many unquestioned facts of daily life, and they are at least evidence of some cause. What is the cause of my illusion of seeing a spirit in the triangle of art? Every smatterer, every expert in psychology will answer, that cause lies in your brain. Embracing the empirical stance that magical experiences are all in the mind, Crowley reasoned, quote, this being true for the ordinary universe, that all sense impressions are dependent on change in the brain, we must include illusions, which are, after all, sense impressions as much as realities are, in the class of phenomena dependent on brain changes. Magical phenomena, claimed Crowley, come under a special subclass since they are willed and he attributed their cause to a series of real phenomena called the operations of ceremonial magic. These operations are of the most empirical nature, being described by Crowley as one, sight, the circle, square, triangle, vessels, lamps, robes, and implements. Two, sound, the invocations. Three, smell, the perfumes. Four, taste, the sacraments. Five, touch, 6. Mind, the combination of all these and reflection on their significance. Operations 1 through 5 were sensory, which, according to Crowley, were unusual impressions because they produce unusual brain changes, and 6. The mind were impressions of usual kind because they projected back into the apparently phenomenal world consisting of the reality of the five operations and effects of ceremonial magic. 
When Crowley referred to the effects of magic, he referred only to phenomena which appear to the magician himself, and the spirits listed in the Goetia are portions of the human brain. The seals, invocations, and visualizations represented to Crowley methods of stimulating or regulating those particular spots of the brain. Salomonic magic, therefore, teaches practitioners how to tap into different regions of their psyche and stimulate specific aspects of their personality, presented in terms of invoking spirits and demons. The whole idea that ancient entities can bring changes in nature by operating with their differing energies is another way of saying the magicians can bring positive change into their lives by addressing all of the potential states of mind, desires, and inspirations. Bringing all this demonology into the real world, the ancient demon Astroth, featured in the 1971 film Bedknobs and Broomsticks, where the star of Astaroth is the artifact that the protagonists get from the Isle of Nabumbu, and in the 1884 adventure classic Ghoulies as one of the demons summoned throughout the film. However, Astaroth first appeared in early 15th century grimoires including the Cambridge Book of Magic, the Discoveries of Witchcraft, Three Books of Occult Philosophy, the Book of Amberlin, and The Lesser Key of Solomon and the Magus in the early 19th century. In the Crowley Mathers version of The Lesser Key of Solomon, Astaroth was the 29th spirit described as a powerful male entity, Great Duke of Hell in the first hierarchy of demons and sitting alongside Beelzebub and Lucifer in the Unholy Trinity. Astaroth featured as an archdemon associated with the Glyphoth, the adverse forces in the contrary tree of life and later Kabbalistic texts, and Crowley translated the description of Astaroth as follows, quote, A mighty, strong duke, and appeareth in the form of a hurtful angel riding on an infernal beast like a dragon, and carrying in his right hand a viper. Thou must in no wise let him approach too near unto thee, lest he do thee damage by his noisome breath. Wherefore the magician must hold the magical ring near his face, and that will defend him. He giveth true answers of the things past, present, and to come, and can discover all secrets. He will declare wittingly how the spirits fell, if desired, and the reason of his own fall. He can make men wonderfully knowing in all liberal sciences. He ruleth forty legions of spirits. His seal is this, which wear thou as a layman before thee, or else he will not appear, nor yet obey thee, etc." Unquote. The Magic of Solomon is an ancient system of universal understanding built upon Kabbalah, therefore self-development, and if it were not for the early medieval grimoires and the works of Victorian magicians, it might have been lost forever. Up next, two different men, two different hospitals, incidents taking place two years apart. Both patients disappear from their beds without a trace. Then later, both are found in their respective hospitals, stuffed into the ceilings. How did that happen? The political season is upon us, and those flying the red colors have their promises. The politicians wearing blue have different promises, but those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your closed-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human, Bigfoot loves our country and you so much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does, so he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past – absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats 
hats, shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. In 2017 and 2019, there were two mysterious cases in South African hospitals involving 53-year-old Sandali Sibaya and 61-year-old Tateki Gotsi. Both men were recuperating from surgery or trauma, banished from their hospital rooms, then some days later were found dead and decomposing in the ceiling spaces of their medical facilities. They would have been unable to get into the ceilings themselves. Were they kidnapped from their beds, murdered and stuffed into the resting places, or could their cases be evidence of spontaneous teleportation? Sandil Sabaya, 53, from Amoti, had come to Durban's Mahatma Gandhi Memorial Hospital in South Africa with a broken femur on May 10, 2019. He had injured his leg while fixing a house. Sandil was married with four children. His cousin, Dudu Mathembu, said the family visited him on May 12th and he'd been waiting to be taken for an X-ray and to see an orthopedic doctor at the nearby Addington Hospital. When hospital staff arrived to take him for the tests, Sandil was nowhere to be found. The KwaZulu Natal Health Department said security staff searched the hospital and its grounds, and when they came up with no sign of him, the hospital contacted the South African Police Department. The hospital had tight security measures in place with a security guard in every unit. However, the quality of this security has been questioned after a survey of Durban Hospital security in 2017 found that a number of hospitals and clinics did not have a security policy in place and that often there was no record of how security incidents were resolved. The Mahatma Gandhi Memorial Hospital was not audited as part of this report. The family was notified that he was missing on May 18th and his children went to the hospital to look for him, but also could not find him. But then the hospital began to be enveloped by an unbearable stench, and staff searched for the source of this odor. Eventually it led to the storeroom, where fluid dripping from the ceiling provided the telltale signs that something was amiss. The ceiling tiles were removed, and a decomposing body was found. The family identified Sabaya's body by the mark on the top of his eye as his body was so putrefied. Although initial media reports claimed that Sabaya was a mental health patient at the hospital, the health department quickly debunked this. He was a builder and an otherwise healthy man apart from the broken leg. How on earth did he end up among the ceiling panels of the hospital? Police spokesperson Lt. Col. Thulani Zwane said an inquest docket was opened at the Phoenix Police Station. Forensic Pathology Services FPS, in Durban performed an autopsy on the body, but the results of this have not been released to the public. Dudu Mathembu said, "...all I want to know is what he was doing in the ceiling with an injured leg. How many days did he spend in that ceiling? We wouldn't have so many questions or be confused if he died on the bed he was in." It is still not clear what the post-mortem examination found in relation to the cause of death were and the investigator's explanation for Sabaya's strange disappearance and death. On October 5, 2017, Tatiki Gotsi, 61 years old, had just undergone abdominal surgery, after which he was placed in a room in Stellenbosch Provincial Hospital on Merriam Street in Stellenbosch east of Cape Town in South Africa. The area is well known for its university and wine production. A nurse visited him in his room at 5.15 a.m., and went out to get some fresh linen for the bed, and when she returned just minutes later, Tateki had vanished from the room. For two days, the hospital authorities kept his disappearance quiet while they searched the hospital. Then, 
the police and family were informed of his mysterious disappearance from his room. Tatecki's brother, Christmas Kithwani, said, "...we received a phone call on October 7 asking if he was not here at home. We told them he was at the hospital, but they said he was not there and that he'd left. We then rushed to the hospital." Fifteen days later, on October 20, Tatecki's body was found in the ceiling in an isolated area of the hospital, in a place where it should be virtually impossible for him to reach by himself. Some workers doing renovations at the hospital had discovered the body and everyone was completely baffled as to how he'd gotten there. Christmas Thawani said the surgery that had been performed on him meant that he should not have been able to walk, never mind climbing up into a ceiling. An autopsy of Tatecki's body showed he had not died from complications resulting from the abdominal surgery procedure and that the cause of death was natural causes. The post-mortem hypothesized that he was placed in the ceiling after he was already dead. But by whom? Christmas said, They, hospital management, said it was clear that my brother did not die as a result of natural causes. He died as a result of something and was placed where he was found. We suspect that someone may have placed him there. They say the autopsy results have come out, but there were some still outstanding. I'll wait for those results to determine whether it was the hospital that killed him or the doctor or even the nurse because clearly he did not die as a result of his health problems. We will wait for them. They must take responsibility. So what happened to these two men? The two theories for the disappearances and deaths are theory one, kidnapped from their beds, murdered, and stuffed in the ceiling space. This is, as bizarre as it seems, the most likely scenario, because theory two is even more bizarre. Spontaneous teleportation. Human teleportation, also called para-teleportation, is the hypothetical phenomenon where a human being, more precisely its physical body, suddenly disappears from a location in space and almost instantaneously reappears in another, usually distant, location in space. This usually happens in a way that's not under the control of the teleported individual, that is, in an unexpected and generally unwanted way. I'll let you decide which theory is the most plausible. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me anytime with your questions or comments at darren at weirddarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. Weirddarkness.com is also where you can find information on any of the sponsors you heard about during the show. Find all my social media. Listen to audiobooks I've narrated. Sign up for the email newsletter find other podcasts that I host. Visit the store for Weird Darkness merchandise and more. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression or dark thoughts. Also on the website, if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories on Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the stories or the authors in the show notes. The Extraordinary Extraterrestrial Abduction of Betty Andreessen was written by Marcus Louth. Catherine Knight, Cannibal Killer, is by Jasmine Kaslaskis for News.com.au. The Premature Burial of Essie Dunbar is by Amber Brees for All That's Interesting. The Bodies in the Ceiling was posted at Strange Outdoors. The Living Skeleton was written by Kashik Patauri for Amusing Planet. And The Ring That Could Control Demons is by Ashley Cowie for Ancient Origins. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Proverbs 18, verse 12. Before his downfall, a man's heart is proud, but humility comes before honor. And a final thought. Always be a first-rate version of yourself instead of a second-rate version of someone else. Judy Garland I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.